Happy to have you today. Oh, this meeting's being recorded, eh? <laughs> we are recording for members that aren't able to make it and see. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah, it's nice to meet you, Brittany. See you face to face. So Everybody nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. We have people from all over. We actually have people from Michigan in Michigan, which is exciting. Um, yes, and this is my my friend Renee Cox. She's visiting. Um, yeah, my, my her husband and, is visiting my husband and I this weekend. So we're zooming in from different locations. But, uh, yeah, hi Renee. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> so we are excited for your presentation. I think Phyllis has went ahead and set it up so that you'll be able to share. I'm going to start with a quick screen cap. We just usually, I share it in our social media with our posts. And then I'll send it to you if you'd like to, you know, share it on your channel as well. Um, so we'll take that picture really fast. All right. And then we can dive right in. We'll have a few people joining us a little bit later as they're able to log in just so you know. Hi. 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 <laughs> Welcome. My husband, Roger. <laughs> Hi, Roger. Thank hey, you, Roger. Hi. Thanks for being here. Our so if everybody is ready, I'm going to take a quick pick. One, two, three. We'll do one more. All right, everybody ready? Mm -hmm. One, two, three. All right, perfect. So can I let you take holding away? up the book, Amy. <laughs> Yeah, so so I was telling Brittany this morning when I give a uh, I talk to book clubs by Zoom, I'm able to share a PowerPoint presentation that usually I only show like at library events and things like that. So that's another advantage of doing this virtually, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's it's short, but it answers you know site basic questions about, you know, my career, the books, how I got the idea, the inspiration for, you know, the Wicked Sister and so forth. And then I'll run through that really fast. If you have questions, you know, about anything that I said in the presentation, of course, you can ask them afterwards. Uh, you could interrupt during if you want, you know, this is all very casual. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so let me go ahead and do the screen share and we can get started here. It just take me a minute to uh, set it up as a slideshow here. So hang on. Um, slideshow from beginning. <laughs> and Karen, I have to say now that I've read Wicked Sister, I have to go back and read The Marsh King's Daughter. This is one yeah, I feel the same favorite. way. <laughs> oh, thank you both so much. Yeah. And I love that um, you came to my work first through The Wicked Sister because, you know, The Marsh King's Daughter was such a huge well, the reception for it all over the world was pretty amazing, as you'll see in some of the pictures I show. And so sometimes in comparison, Rachel feels like the redheaded stepchild, you know, she could never live up to her big sister, Helena. So I'm very happy that you you discovered my work through through the Wicked Sister. So, you know, these are my books, obviously, uh, Marsh King's Daughter and the Wicked Sister. And um, let's see here. There we go. So. Um, these two books are my two most recent novels. I have other novels. And in fact, The Marsh King's Daughter published roughly 20 years after I started seriously pursuing publication. Um, as I mentioned, the reception for The Marsh King's Daughter was pretty astonishing. This is a screenshot of some of the languages that it's um, published in. It comes to 26 languages around the world. And I don't know how many countries because, you know, some languages like Spanish covers, covers many countries. And I do think it's cool how the covers are similar and yet different. And if you're wondering even about the titles, sometimes the titles are changed in other countries. Like for instance, the Italian right there in the middle, that's um, the house of the father. You know, I don't speak Italian, but I do know that much. And so both the title and the cover are considered marketing tools. And so the individual publishers in these various countries um, tweak them for their audience. Um, I really like the Russian cover that's right next to the Italian. It looks very moody, you know, like I think of a Russian swamp would be. And yet two over the Portuguese, that looks like, you know, um, an open area. It doesn't look like an upper peninsula swamp to me or marsh, but that's what people in that country would think of. 
So, you know, that's all pretty cool. When the Marsh King's Daughter started publishing in these other countries, my publishers and sometimes people I knew in those countries would send me pictures. Like this is the Dutch version. And my publisher bought these posters all over, I don't know how many cities, you know, to advertise it. So that was, that was cool to see that. Um, somebody sent me this picture from Poland and uh, you can see it up there right next to some guy named, I don't know, Stephen King. I don't know. If you're <laughs> Unknown guy. And I, I'm pretty sure this is a truck stop because uh, if your screen is showing it, there's a little bit of a map over on the other side. And this looks like it's the audio version. And while I don't speak um, Polish, I'm pretty sure I know what bestseller means. So that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> and then when um, a friend sent me these pictures from Spain, and, you know, the, the picture of the bookstore window just blows my mind. You know, not only did they devote the whole window to the book, but I'm pretty sure that poster is as tall as I am, right? <laughs> so, and again, when you go in the bookstore, you know, how could you possibly miss that, that title? So that was really cool to see. And then in um, Sweden, the Marsh King's Daughter was chosen as the book of the month by like the largest bookstore has kind of like a book club, they feature feature a book. And, excuse me, I misspoke, not the largest bookstore, just the largest chain of stores. So they have everything from big box stores down to little mom and pop places, and they discount the book. So this is what some of the displays looked like <laughs> for the Marsh King's Daughter in Sweden. Um, that picture on the left, you know, it kind of makes me laugh because if you imagine walking into the bookstore thinking, well, what book should I read? Oh, maybe this one, <laughs> you know, it's got like a million copies right in front of them. And the picture on the right um, tickles me because it looks like a Sam's Club or a Costco, you know, that we would have in the States. And of course, as you're shopping for loungewear and whatever is in those bins over there, you're gonna wanna buy a copy of my novel, right? <laughs> so not surprisingly, um, The Marsh King's Daughter hit number one in Sweden and um, on their on their bestseller list. And it was also a bestseller in Germany and in Iceland. So, you know, that of course was very cool. Um, two of my publishers brought me over to their country to do book signings. Um, you probably recognize the, the Ferris wheel coming out of my head in the picture on the left. So that's London. <laughs> and my UK publisher brought me over. And then my Norwegian publisher brought me over to participate in a, in a author's festival, like a thriller, suspense, mystery author's festival. And um, so this is Oslo in early March. And I loved it so much. Um, you all know that my books are set in the Upper Peninsula, both The Marsh King's Daughter and The Wicked Sister, where I lived for a lot of years. And um, uh, Norway, my kids asked me, what's Norway like? And I said, it's like the Upper Peninsula on steroids. It's, you know, <laughs> mountains coming right down to the sea. My, my first book event, um, I was speaking with a Swedish and a Norwegian author at a ski lodge in a forest about an hour south of Oslo. And, you know, it was like, yes, yes, <laughs> that's, that's my kind of place. And my husband came with me on both these trips because, I mean, really, you know, I can't go gallivanting around the world without him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And then, as some of you may know, um, The Marsh King's Daughter is currently in development as a movie. Mm -hmm. um, it's being produced by Black Bear Pictures, which is the production company responsible for the imitation game with Benedict Cumberbatch and anonymous content. And they're responsible for the movie Spotlight, which won best picture the year. You know, that was the one about the news, news people in um, Boston, I think it was breaking a big story. Right. And, and the movie, The Revenant, um, which Leonardo DiCaprio won an Oscar for. So this is not small potatoes, right? <laughs> um, Mark Smith wrote the uh, screenplay for The Revenant and it's going to be distrib distributed in the US by STX Films. And I, I'm learning about the process as this goes along. So that's the equivalent of, let's say Sony Pictures or Disney, you know, they're, they're the ones that are backing getting the movie into theaters because they are planning it as a theatrical release, if you can believe that. Um, these are the people who are starring in the movie. Uh, you might recognize some of the names, um, you might not. I had to look them up because I don't watch a lot of movies, which is, I mean, I write books, right? 
So, uh, but these are pictures. So um, Daisy Ridley, she was Ray in the recent Star Wars movies. Hmm. This is Ben Mendelsohn, who's, who's starring as her father in the Marsh King's Daughter movie. And these are the secondary characters and they, they're all, you know, well-known actors in their own right. So it's pretty cool to see so much talent attached to this particular project. You know, they could choose any movie or, or any book to bring to the screen. And the fact that all of these people want to bring this story to the screen, it still just blows my mind. Um, the Marsh King's Daughter is currently filming. <laughs> uh, I just about died when I saw this picture on Instagram because, you know, did I ever dream that there would be a movie clapper board with the title of my <laughs> book on it? No. <laughs> so that was, that was pretty crazy. And I have to tell a little story here. So the movie has been in the works for about three years. And every time it made some forward motion, my literary agent would say, don't get excited. It's Hollywood. Anything can happen. And indeed, over that three year period, there's been three actresses attached to the project and five directors. So yes, it is a very fluid sort of thing. And this spring, when it started looking like it was coming together, my agent, you know, same thing, don't get excited, don't get excited. So when this put picture posted, <laughs> um, I asked him, now can I get excited? <laughs> and he said, not till they send you the check. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was fun. Um, this, these are some pictures, like not a lot of news has filtered out from the filming. They try to keep a pretty tight lid on it, as you might imagine. They're filming in Canada in, in various locations in Ontario and in some of the small towns around Toronto. And so these are some of the early pictures of where they're actually filming. It's such a remote area that it required a 20 minute boat ride to get into this location. Um, this is the director of photography, you know, on set doing whatever he does, <laughs> supervising the photography, right? He also posted a short clip to Instagram of a helicopter lowering equipment down to this location. So, you know, uh, yeah, again, that blows my mind. I know what helicopters rent for and they don't come cheap. <laughs> and here are some other scenes, you know, from behind, you know, not of the stars. This is, this is of the filming. And it's super interesting for me because, you know, when we see, when we watch a movie, I mean, who, who watches the credits all the way to the end? Nobody, right? You know, but all of those people worked on the movie and then some. So, you know, this is some of what, uh, you know, the crew and how they had to transport the equipment by boat. And I'm, I'm thinking uh, those are the lowly workers out front in that boat with the raincoats on. <laughs> and maybe that's the director or somebody in the, uh, in the cabin. So that's the Marsh King's Daughter and that's the movie and that's the, the book that, you know, basically just took my career in writing to another, another level. The Wicked Sister has also done very well. When, um, I, I signed with my publisher Putnam, it was for a two book deal, even though I had no idea what the next book was going to be. And so um, that turned out to be The Wicked Sister, which you know you all have now read. Some of the inspiration for both books, The Marsh King's Daughter and The Wicked Sister comes from this. Uh, what you're looking at is a picture from 1974 of the piece of property that my husband and I bought in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Uh, we were part of the back to the land movement where young people who grew up in the city wanted to feel closer to nature and, you know, so they moved to the country. For this first summer, we lived in the little tent, that little blue tent while we built our cabin. We carried water from a stream and we sampled wild foods, which I drew on those experiences very heavily for the Marsh King's daughter because this is about that story is about a family that lives completely off the grid. And, um, you know, again, for the Wicked Sister too, because the setting is still the Upper Peninsula Wilderness. When we moved into this tent, our daughter was six weeks old. Mm -hmm. um, this is her now at about, I don't know, a couple months. Um, she looks a little worried in that picture, but I promise you she, she had a good time. That's, of course, it's all she knew. Um, this is what, uh, we looked like here, you know, towards the end of the first winter. This is this is what the cabin we built. Didn't we do a good job? Yeah. Mm -hmm.
and the interior I'm so proud of this because I'm actually like 22 years old in this picture <laughs> and I think wow you know we built this cabin and we made it homey and cozy and, and so forth so again um, we lived in the Upper Peninsula for 30 years and raised our family there and I do think it's interesting I didn't mention but my early novels were set in what I thought of as exotic places the first book was set in Antarctica because I lived in the Upper Peninsula. I can write about ice and snow and cold, right? <laughs> and then the next book was set at Chaitan Volcano in Northern Patagonia, Chile. They were considered environmental thrillers. And I was choosing locations that to me seemed exotic, you know, unusual places that I, I might like to visit one day. And not realizing that the place where I lived, you know, home, more or less, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan would also be consider it an exotic location to many other people who don't live there. So uh, this is uh, what the cabin looks like now and <laughs> not much left of it. They built a second story on it and an addition behind, uh, but there's, there's the steps and the stone that my husband laid up and there's the window. When I was touring the Upper Peninsula uh, for the Marsh King's Daughter paperback a couple years ago, and excuse me, I know the woman who lives in the house now was home. So I stopped and she invited me to come in and have a cup of tea. So her living room, you know, that's the space that we made. And so that was, that was really cool to be in that space again. So that's one source of inspiration for the Wicked Sister. The other source, as you all know, is the Wicked Sister takes place not in a humble shack, a humble log cabin, but a beautiful hunting lodge. Um, when I first started writing it, I thought I just wanted to make it the opposite of what Helena's situation was in The Marsh King's Daughter. And I will also mention that my husband and I used to do furniture upholstery when we lived in the Upper Peninsula. So we've been in some of those beautiful log cabins, you know, to, to uh, look at their furniture and, and deliver them and so forth. So I decided to make it really over the top, not realizing that there is such a log cabin in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. This is an aerial shot of a cabin <laughs> called Granite, G-A-R-O, G-A-R, G, I'll get it, G-R-A-N-O-T, Granite, Lomba. It's actually the biggest log cabin in the world. Wow. And I got these pictures off the realtor's website because it's for sale for like 40 million. So, you know, if you all want to go, <laughs> go in together and have a nice summer <laughs> retreat, it's available. <laughs> So, you know, again, you know, you all having read The Wicked Sister, you know, you can clearly see where I got the inspiration for some of the um, over the topness of how beautiful the hunting lodge is. Um, this picture will probably look familiar to you. Although because it's fiction, I made the room bigger and I made more animals because, you know, you can do that when you're making things up. Uh, uh, and then um, there was another picture, and I guess I missed it, um, but there was a picture in this cabin of the, the stairwell, and um, it has like, it's made out of half logs, and it has scenes painted on the end, and again, you know, I, I copied that part for the Wicked Sister. And then the other big source of inspiration for the Wicked Sister is black bears. <laughs> um, black bears are Michigan's largest predator, and I wanted to do, you know, put them in the book, not as something to be feared, like, you know, a grizzly bear terrorizing a campground or something like that, but, you know, as a, as a beautiful creature that has its place in nature, you know, to be admired. And so I, I started with black bears. Um, I don't have any personal experience with black bears, although um, mm -hmm. I... There were a couple of times when we lived up north where I could have seen a black bear if I wanted to. Uh, there was one time I was carrying my daughter in a backpack on my back and I was walking down a deserted road intending to pick some apples and some um, choke cherries. That's a little tiny cherry, but it makes good jelly. And as I'm walking along, I came upon a pile of bear dung and it wasn't too fresh. And so I wasn't too worried about it. Kept going another pile, a little fresher, another pile, a little fresher. The last pile I saw was practically steaming. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm not going to go pick cherries today. <laughs> I couldn't quite picture climbing a tree to get away from a bear with my, my daughter on my back. So uh, yeah, I could have seen black bears. So instead to do research, 
I visited this man. Uh, this is Dean Oswald, and in the book I mentioned Oswald's Bear Ranch in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, which is a real place. He started many years ago with a, a couple of orphaned bear cubs, and it's grown to where he has between 50 and 70 animals at any given time. His facility, as I say in the book, is strictly rescue. So, you know, males are in one area, females another. He doesn't do any breeding. He takes in orphaned cubs or bears that, you know, maybe they were in a, one of those horrible roadside zoos in a, in a little cage, and now they have a chance to roam and so forth. And he, um, obviously, this is a, a bear that he must have raised from a cub. Uh, when I learned a lot of bear facts from him, and one of the things that I thought was really cool was he and his staff work so hard in the spring and summer and early fall to feed these bears, you can imagine. So they do collect food scraps from the area, you know, hospitals and schools and grocery stores, because bears are omnivorous, they'll eat anything. Um, but then come, come fall, when the bears hibernate, you know, they dig their own dens, they go to sleep, and there's literally nothing for them to do. They could go away for the winter too while their, their bears take care of themselves. And uh, my husband and I saw how, like when they fed the bears, they would drive into the enclosure on a four wheeler and have these big white buckets of, of junk <laughs> food <laughs> that they would dump and then the bears would come and eat. And I really wanted to go in an enclosure too. And he said, he had taken a friend in once, you know, who wanted to do the same thing and um, a bear didn't bite her, but it, it just put its teeth on her arm, you know, and so he couldn't bring me inside for insurance purposes. But to give you an idea of how I think, I thought like, how cool would that be if you had some scars on your arm? And you could say, yeah, yeah, this is what a bear did. <laughs> so um, this was as close as I got. <laughs> they had this standard little um, tourist thing where, you know, for 10 bucks, you can get your picture taken with a cub. And there's a trick to this photo. I'm, I'm going to make it bigger on my screen. Can, can you see? I'm holding a wooden spoon painted black. Oh, there's I jelly on the end of the spoon. Now. Yeah, you have to look very closely. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty yeah. good trick though, isn't it? <laughs> So um, yeah, that, this is as close as I got to the bears and you know, double chain link fence was probably a good idea anyway. So, so um, at this point I'm done talking. I, I'm happy to turn it over to everybody for questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the uh, screen share here and uh, we can talk about the book. <laughs> Well, that was fun. Thanks for that. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. You know, it's, um, like I say, that's the short version. If I give a library talk, I talk for like an hour. <laughs> but I want to do a lot of discussion. So, um, there, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, I really enjoyed it. My mom grew up in Escanaba and Oh, um, when I was in the UP last year, we went to Copper Harbor and Marquette, and um, so it was really nice to just hear about all the local places and to come and I've called. It's been a, a couple times, so yeah. um, just able to visualize exactly where you were it was really cool. You know, I don't get to read many novels that place right where I am. Yeah, that's really cool, and you know the the. Both novels are being read all over the world, which is is kind of amazing. And so, when people, readers in those countries, read my novels, all they know of Michigan or the Upper Peninsula is what I put in the book. But someone who's familiar with the Michigan and with the UP, you know, you bring all your personal experience to the story too. So, you know, that makes that makes it really nice. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. And there there are two sources of inspiration for the Wicked Sister that I I don't you know, they're not visual. And so I, I don't include them in that presentation. But um, as far as like, why I wrote about Rachel as somebody who believed that she was responsible you know, for, for taking her parents' lives through an accidental shooting. Um, it's, it's funny, the things that inspire authors, uh, sometimes it's just a small item in a newspaper. And we know that, that there are far too many accidental shootings. Um, I read one where a toddler was sitting in the back seat of uh, the family car 
and he found a loaded handgun in his mother's purse, and he shot and killed her through the seat with it. And it's so horrible, you know. I don't, I, I almost hate to relate it because it's so horrible and tragic. But I was thinking to myself, well, at some point that little boy is going to grow up, and he's inevitably going to find out what he did. You know, you wouldn't tell a, a toddler or a, a young child, but at some point he's going to find out. And you know, how would that change you? You would, you would be growing up thinking, you know, I'm a good person. I, I wouldn't hurt anybody. And then, you know, when you find out that you did indeed, you know, even though you were, it was an accident and you were, you were a baby back practically, you're still responsible for taking your mother's life. So that was the sort of thing that I wanted to explore with Rachel's character. What effect would that have on her? And then the other source of inspiration has to do with. Um, Rachel's sister, Diana, you know, uh, many years ago, friends of ours adopted three siblings and uh, behavioral issues because, you know, they were real adoption, obviously, a not so nice home life. The two younger children did really well in the new environment, but the older child just more and more difficult, disruptive, and, you know, he was, he was violent towards his younger brothers and sisters. So at one point, um, 12, and they put him in an institution. And I, again, I thought, how heartbreaking is that? You know, how do you reach the point at the point where you decide, you know, I can't do this anymore. And think of the younger two, I have to send my. So. Somebody needs to go on mute. Can you guys mute if you're not talking? Um, yeah, okay. Well, it went away anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, that's what I'm exploring with Jenny's character in the story, you know, and, and while it seems like it's a tragic story, I hope you guys see it as ultimately redemptive. You know, I do, because it's like Rachel had this several strikes against her, right, as a child, as she was growing up. So how do you become an adult, a, a functioning adult, and not be defined by the bad things that happened to you when you were young? So so that's another theme that runs through the book. So uh, questions? Anybody? Jim, are you raising your hand? Go ahead. <laughs> So it sounds like whenever you're writing a book, there's a lot of psychology involved in it. You have to really understand these issues to be able to write about them in a realistic way. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. And um, when I was writing The Marsh King's Daughter, I didn't. I did a little bit of research into what it was like um, to have a child in captivity, you know, because there were, that. that's the core of The Marsh King's Daughter. I'm sorry, I didn't give a, a summary of the book at the beginning. So. You know there were some like like Amanda Berry and J.C. Dugard who had children in captivity, but because I didn't go too deeply into that because um, I was telling the story of the daughter, you know, who was who was raised in those circumstances. But for the Wicked Sister, I did have to research, you know, psychopathy in, in children, and what I presented in the book is pretty much the results of the research. You know, not everybody believes that um, a child can be labeled a psychopath but they do show those tendencies early on. Uh, there were two main sources of research. There was an article in the New York Times and an article in the Atlantic on, you know, what it was like to raise a psychopath as, a, you know, from a child. And sadly, you know, most of the incidents that I have in the book are, are true, you know, and children have really done. Um, the other good source of information for me, which was pretty cool, was there's a website. It's kind of like Wikipedia, uh, only, it's more interactive. You can ask questions and experts you know, will answer them. So there are people on that website who purport to be psychopaths. And it's interesting. I learned that, okay, let me get this right. So every serial killer is a psychopath. Not every psychopath is a serial killer, right? I mean, we might work with psychopaths. We might know someone in, in our life and you know they've learned coping techniques to you know get by but for instance, um, one of the things that people asked it on this uh, discussion was, how do you feel when your girlfriend breaks up with you? And the answer is, 
nothing. I feel nothing. You know, it's, it's, and they can have people in their lives. They can have relationships as long as it serves their purpose somehow, you know, somehow benefits them. So it was really interesting to, you know, read these answers that psychopaths have, what emotions do they feel and not feel, which is, it's very little really that they feel they're just born without that ability to, and especially, you know, no empathy or, or compassion, which is why, you know, in the novel, um, Diana, some people think it's animal cruelty, you know, when she does her little experiments on animals. I don't think of it that way because I think that um, in her mind, she doesn't think of it as being cruel. She's just, it's curiosity. You know, she wants to find out what does an animal look like from the inside. So, so she does that. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that you already touched on and you, we brought in an excellent an analogy there, a true story actually from the, the child who was in the back seat, who is a toddler, very young child in a car seat and he gets the loaded gun and shoots through the seat is that there's the parents, there's that very difficult subject of the parents' culpability and the tension between the parents when you have a child like this and they don't agree and how difficult it is to put a child in an institution. And I think we've gone through different times in our lives where maybe for younger people it's different now, but I grew up at a time and a place where people did send a child away for even for things like down syndrome you know yeah. some some families that the child was in the home and mainstream went to school but i mean even when i was in elementary school down syndrome children were not in the schools i don't know what the parents did but they weren't in my public schools in illinois at the time so that's changed over the years but there's been shifting societal attitudes about how do you take care of children who are different. And this is like an extreme case. So you also brought up that tension between the parents and between the community of what is your responsibility as a parent? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, that's very insightful. And I also wanted, um, I mean, obviously in the book, Jenny's biggest error mistake is not being honest with her husband about what was really going on, you know, and they, uh, I set it up to where they were at odds, you know, but of course, Jenny's to blame for that. Um, but we don't always make decisions with the head. Sometimes we make decisions with our heart and sometimes they're very bad decisions. So that's, that's what happened there. Yeah, I was, um, I was really, I, I really liked Jenny in particular as a character and, and her husband too, although I think we know more of I think we have more information or get more about Jenny, obviously, because she's narrating. Um, but I, you know, I was so sad when she got killed and when the, her husband gets killed. And I was thinking all along, like, okay, at what point do you, especially since she already has suspicions about her daughter when she's very, very young about the little boy in the swimming pool and, and whether she, you know, may, she, that she probably was involved in some way because her clothes were wet. And then other things happen. And then of course, when she shoves her off the freaking cliff, that's kind of a big red flag and loses her baby. So I, I think at that point, I was like, what? at that point, I was just like, no, you have to ha do something proactive about this child because she's obviously tried to kill you, killed your baby, and, um, but even at that point, she doesn't, now that might be, I'm, I can't remember the exact time frame. that might be close to the culmination or maybe not, but I just thought, no, you, you probably at that point need to have done something, whatever it might be with a, you know, with um, hospitalization or something. My sister actually, we did, my sister had mental illness and epilepsy that she she was born mentally ill but epilepsy came when she was 14 and we and my parents did put her in a hospital a mental hospital so I guess it's like an institution and she never lived at home again after that she's much better now but you know they couldn't care for her they couldn't work and keep her um you know she was having seizures gone mal seizures and so forth and, and sort of mentally triggered but anyway so yeah I'm familiar with that 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate your comments and, and you know, your personal insight. And that's the thing. Um, as a writer, I, I make things up. And then I meet someone like you who that's like part of your life. You know, this this was real to you. I, I couldn't agree more that um, if, it, if this had been Jenny's story, if it had been a different kind of book, I would have had her institutionalize the daughter and then, you know, effects of that on the marriage and going forward and so forth. But, you know, the book is really Rachel's story. And, it, you know, it starts with this tragedy in the family. And how does Rachel get past that as an adult, you know, and not be defined by this, this terrible thing that happened. So, um, yeah, it kind of veered off in that direction. But, uh, yeah, another thing that some people have thought was unrealistic, because I read all my reviews. <laughs> your brain <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um some have have thought well rachel could not have lived in a mental institution all those years she couldn't have been warehoused you know but she made no attempt to get better and and i'm sorry not every mental institution especially uh you know large state-run facilities are designed to make a person get better you know some don't have access to that kind of care so uh, that was the situation so one of the big takeaways for me in this book was the, from a parent's perspective, the unconditional love for a child, how much we protect them. And even when there's something very obvious that's wrong, the fact that she didn't tell her own sister of the diagnosis of Diana, that she was a psychopath. And the fact that Rachel never knew that her sister was a psychopath. I think those were two huge things and keeping things from her husband, of course. But if she had told Charlotte, hey, here's what's going on with Diana. We still need to give her a ton of attention and love, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think it would have completely changed the way of the story because ultimately Diana was the one who completely snowed Charlotte into killing for her and yeah. protecting her. So the fact that the mom finally got to the point where she and her husband were going to institutionalize or, you know, turn her into the police or whatever, it was way too late because at that point she was an adult. She, you know, knew what was going on. Of course she didn't want to be institutionalized or whatever. And she got Charlotte to do her bidding and, I, I think that was one of the most tra uh, tragic things of the book was not being honest with the people that you love to their detriment. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's the thing about um, psychological suspense, which is, you know, what the category of books I write is um, people make bad decisions and then, you know, they, they face the consequences of those bad decisions. So um, if I was if I was writing cozy mysteries, you know, let's say <laughs> it would be a whole other level, you know, everything would be cute and funny and all like, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what makes people do the things they do. And, you know, that's what I like to explore in the books. So, so what do you yeah. all think of, um, of the ending? Like, um, should Rachel have spoilers for those who have, my friends who haven't necessarily read the book? <laughs> should, should Rachel have killed Diana at the end? Or did you, do you think she did the right thing? I think she was. I think she, I liked it. Well, part of it for me is that you had inserted a lot about the, the fairy tales, you know, the good versus evil. And that was, you know, for her to kill her. I mean, yeah, she gets rid of the villain, so to speak, but that that's not really her true nature. Yeah. So it was it was right on on the line. I thought, you know, of course at first that she did kill her. And then there was that final twist where she didn't. I was like, yeah, like, you know, just well I think it was kind I of think she lived with at that point because she was going to get killed. She knew Diana was going to kill her. I, mean, it was, I don't think she had any doubt. The character that kind of surprised me is Charlotte, because yes, she, her, her sister never told her that we have this diagnosis of this child. However, how much do you get roped in by somebody's personality to actually 
kill somebody for them she shoots peter she i just yeah. i was like okay i don't know she has a personality disorder yes, of does. some kind that you know and yes. i know rachel talks about it because she's been in a mental institution and she's learned everything about every personality disorder and borderline personality disorder that exists but I, I was like, no, there's something, no, Charlotte's off. That's just not something, I, I mean, some, you would have some ethics and morals and draw the line somewhere. I, I mm -hmm. would. Well, think of so, like Charles Manson and yep. the yeah. movies, right? You know, yep. they did, they did kill for him. So I, you know. there are these killer couples that happen where you get two people where one's pretty, pretty damaged and the other may be marginal. And yeah. there's this horrible alchemy that happens. There's this bad chemistry where you get, you can even have two people, I think, you know, we've seen people in these spree killer kind of things where they're both kind of marginal. But then when they get together, absolutely the worst happens. And yeah. that, that might have been the, the, you know, Charlotte's, where if she'd gone without meeting her own uh, niece, she could have been fine or it could have been okay <laughs> I know. but then that that combination yeah that's another layer of tragedy i don't know why you know it's it's something that i like to explore because again you know i nobody's life is perfect you know we all have bad things that happen at different times and uh, i've said this already but you know my my personal thing is how do you move past that? How do you get beyond it? How do you, you know, not be defined by the bad things that maybe happened when you were a child or or other setbacks that we have? You know, how do you overcome it? So I like to think it. Yeah. Yeah, books are ultimately stories of. Them. I think another thing yeah. that came ahead. into play. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna say, going back to your question, and you kind of tied it back in with, how do you move past it? She spent her whole life feeling guilty for a crime she didn't commit. And she just kind of broke free of that. For her to kill her sister, she'd be right back where she was, feeling guilty for that. So she couldn't do that and move on. And then um, the other thing I just wanted to bring up is it took me a while, and I was questioning, is this book magical realism, or is does she have her own psychopathy? <laughs> Where she's, she's talking to the animals. And I got to the point where I chose to think you just built some magical realism into it. So I don't know if that was the intent or not. You know, I, I love that you brought that up because the, the talking to animals bit, it's like you can believe what you want. You know, there are people that seem to have a deeper connection with animals, you know, horse whisperers and, and people who interact with lions and tigers on, on some sort of plane that, you know, a normal person doesn't. So maybe it's that, maybe she's, you know, got some mental issues herself. Maybe it's magical realism, as you say. Uh, I think one of the major reviews for the book said, called it magical realism dusted <laughs> book, you know, so there's <laughs> a, little, a little touch of it. And um, I, I will deviate for a minute. Um, Amy mentioned fairy tales, and this ties into that thought too, uh, Gretchen, of, of uh, Rachel being able to speak to animals. So I said how I took a two book deal from my publisher, even though I had no idea what the next book was going to be. My editor laid out four things that the new book should have in common with The Marsh King's Daughter. Hmm. So again, psychological suspense, same or very similar setting, um, a fairy tale element, and a intricate structure. And I was, I was really happy that he named the last two criteria because those were things I was most proud of in The Marsh King's Daughter. For those who um, haven't read The Marsh King's Daughter, it parallels the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale of the same name quite directly. Um, and the story it's told in the present and the past <clears throat> by the same character. Oops, gonna have to take a little swig here, hang on. <laughs> by, the, <clears throat> by the same character. But the um, sections in the past begin with an excerpt from the fairy tale. So it very directly parallels the fairy tale. I did not want to do that exactly in The Wicked Sister because I didn't want to make a copy of the book. You know, I wanted it to be its own story. So instead, as you all know, I, you know, reference fairy tales a lot. And, but I also wanted to create the feel as if the story itself was a fairy tale. You know, like the, the beautiful hunting lodge on, on the pristine acre, 4,000 acres of woods. It's like the castle in the forest, right? And, you know, the, the fraught relationship between really both, both pairs of sisters, 
is like um, Cinderella and her wicked stepsisters, right? You know, you have conflict between sisters often in fairy tales. And in fairy tales, don't aren't there always talking animals? <laughs> so I threw that into the mix as well. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to, I, I really love that part with the fairy tales because when I was, you know, eight, nine, and I just read everything I could get my hands on. And that meant that big, giant, thick, grimless fairy tale. And it, they're not Disney movies, you know? I mean, they're so dark and you're like, oh, and that you, you put that in there. And then, you know, like here's Rachel. She is the, you know, the, the princess, so to speak. She talked to the animals. She's, you know, she's a little bit naive and all this stuff. She believes in the good. And then there's Diana who she's not necessarily you know, like the, you know, the, she is the wicked sister, of course, but the fact that she went directly to the villain, like to her, that was the most interesting part of the story. So that's what she wanted to play out. I was just like, I, I thought that was really cool. I enjoyed oh, thank it. You. I appreciate your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I didn't think that it was magical, her talking to the animals. I thought that it either had something to do with her internal dialogue. Like, remember how she couldn't pull memories out, but once she got into that setting, then she was able to. So it was almost for me, it was like they were in her head, but she was like, I think the word is anthropomorphizing when you put your own personality or people things onto animals. Um, that was what I took away from it, that she was, you know, she did have this relationship with these animals and insects, but it was more her own inside her own head. Thanks. That's actually how I personally see it too. But like I say, there's a lot of room for interpretation and you notice the animals don't offer anything particularly useful, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they don't make long speeches and, and so forth. So they are like reflecting the thoughts that she's having. And yeah, yeah. Thanks. I, I agree with Natalie's assessment there. That's pretty much how I took it. It threw me at first. I was like, oh no, what is, I don't, <laughs> I was going to have a problem with that, but then as it went on and I fell into, you know, Nat, how Natalie described it there, then I could, because yeah. otherwise it was going to get a little, a little out there for me. <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. I really yeah. did. Thank you. And see, as an author, I like to push the boundaries, you know, so as I'm writing that, I'm thinking, is this too far? Is this too weird? <laughs> is this too much? <laughs> And my editor let it stand, so uh, yeah, it's in the book. I love this book. This is probably one of my top, one of, you know, we read a lot of books. We've read a lot of books in this book club. Um, what are we reading, two a month, Brittany? Something like that. <laughs> I think so. I think that's the way that you so much. I mean, it's a tough schedule. <laughs> so <laughs> it started last year, the pandemic year, and now we're into the kind of our second year, really. And um, so we've read a lot of books, but this is definitely on the top, you know, five or list of, for me. So I, I really, I was, I could not stop. Until I think I Meryl read. and I were reading it like tandem, like hand in hand. So I was, you don't know, but she's on the back side of my wall. We have townhomes and we basically share <laughs> a wall, which is super fun. So oftentimes we'll start one at the same time, even though there's a whole collective conversation. And she and I will have our own side track. And I think Bailey was reading it at the same time Meryl and I was. And so Bailey and I would be talking about it. I'm like, oh my goodness, can you believe this happened? Or can you believe that developed? One of my questions is, did you know the ending when you started? Or I, I didn't catch that. Could you say that again? Did Your you know question? the ending when you started? How it was going yes. to end? Or did it evolve and change? Um, it evolved evolved somewhat like like I didn't know what Charlotte's role was going to be when I introduced her um, I did envision that you know there would of course be a final confrontation between Rachel and Diana and um, I knew that it would involve um, uh, you know Rachel making the decision not to kill her sister you know not to become like her sister but uh, the the Charlotte part did was a little surprising that developed as I was writing and I have to say as an author those are some of the most fun moments, you know, I mean, you, you, you can plan it out and I do outline my books broadly, not, not in great specifics because I like those moments where, you know, as I'm writing, I may be two thirds or three quarters of the way through the book and I have an idea and I'm like, oh, I could do this and this and this. And then you realize you've laid the groundwork for that. 
it fits. You don't have to go back and change things from the beginning. So it's almost like you're writing on a conscious level and also a subconscious level and your subconscious is leading you to this place, you know, that then at some point you consciously discover. And um, it, it's a very cool part of the process. Oh, I had a friend. Karen, how do you get along with your sister? <laughs> I have two sisters. Yes, I'm the middle sister. Um, I had some some pins made that said, you know, the wicked sister. And um, <laughs> when they both wanted them, but they both agree I'm probably the wicked sister. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I was the black sheep. I was the one who questioned everything. And uh, yeah, so, but we, we do get along great. Thank you. But I also had um, three daughters, and so I watched their relationships as well. So, yeah. Uh, the Marsh King's daughter focuses very heavily on the relationship between a daughter and her father. And I, I adored my father growing up. So, you know, that part of that story was easy to write. And so now I'm writing, you know, with Sister Features, the sister relationship. The book I'm working on now is tentatively titled The Counterfeit Granddaughter. <laughs> And so I'm working with the grandparent granddaughter relationship because I think that can be so interesting. We know that there are a lot of grandparents who are raising their grandchildren, right? You know, but also like, you know, the, the grandparent and the grandchild, sometimes the grandchild, you know, like reveres the grandparent and they get along really well because, you know, they don't have to be the, the disciplinarian and so forth, you know, so, um, and briefly, this story also takes place in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Um, in The Marsh King's Daughter, I used as a setting the marsh or the swamp. The Wicked Sister takes place in the forest, as you all know. And another big part of the geography of the Upper Peninsula is the Great Lakes, um, specifically Lake Superior. So this story takes place in a little village on the shore of Lake Superior. And you know many of the, the book's events will take place on the lake, which I've been out a few times. Um, Renee, my friend here, knows that uh, we recently moved to a house with a very little lake, and we have a very little boat. So I'm going to go out on the boat and pretend it's Lake Superior and, and the waves <laughs> crashing and all of that, right? <laughs> She's laughing because it's going to take a lot of imagination. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so I'm working on that novel now and uh, hope to finish by the end of the summer, early fall. And then, you know, it might publish in about a year. I have one quick question. Um, sure. I, when I was reading the book and when Rachel first got to the lodge and it was so big and so empty, I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, she could just go into a room and they'd never know. And then that happened and I was like, ooh, that's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do wonder how did Diana know she was there? Yeah, I think, I think Rachel just wasn't quite as clever as she thought, you know. Um, it doesn't take much, a footstep or something like that. Um, this, this is a little off topic, but um, my, my dad, he passed away uh, from Alzheimer's. And my oldest daughter went to live with them at one point, you know, thinking it would be like a jumping off point to adulthood, you know, lived in the city. And he, it didn't work out because he couldn't get used to there being another person in the house. So he would hear like the floor creak upstairs and he'd be like, who's in the house? You know, somebody's in the house and so forth. So I, I think maybe, you know, it comes from that a little bit. I, I think, you know, it wasn't her plan from the beginning, very beginning, and that she must have left some little clues along the way. Plus, you know, Diana has lived there for so many years. She knows the place. It, it wouldn't take much out of place, a spoon or something like that for her to, to catch on to things. But that's very cool that you, you thought she would do that. <laughs> I actually, I, we used, I grew up in Illinois. We used to go to Wisconsin for the most part and camp. My parents were school teachers. We had a lot of time in the summer and we camped a lot in Wisconsin and also in the Upper Peninsula and around Lake Michigan. And those are gorgeous, gorgeous country. If any of you have never been there, it's, it's pretty amazing. But we did often have black bears. And, but they, they knew you were camping. They knew there was food around. We were never any kind of threat. But I, one of my early memories is, in, you know, this is way back in the day. So buying food wasn't the same as buying now. And my parents would buy food. And then that was supposed to last us for, you know, a week or two. 
out there where we were camping fairly remote and a bear, black bear came into the, our campsite at night and he ate our bacon. And my mom was so angry. She was out there yelling that she had paid, and I forget what it was, you know, 99 cents a pound or whatever. She had paid for that bacon and it was going to be like an hour trip to get any more. So that was the big, that was what she was upset about is the black bear. And the black bear just stared at us. So he, he was not going to stop. <laughs> it's so funny how you, you know, these little incidents. And that's, again, a fun thing about being a writer. You can, you can put these into the book. So, um, when we were first living up north, again, we were city kids. We weren't used to all the woods noises. I made jams and jellies over an open campfire, which is a, a heck of a lot of work, let me tell you. <laughs> and so one night we heard some noises and it was a raccoon coming around. I had the jars cooling on a, on a, a we had like a, a shelf unit that just sat out in the open that was gonna go in the house eventually. And I was like, you are not getting my jelly. I worked too hard for that jelly. So I found something in the tent that would make some noise and I ran out yelling, but you know, I was terrified <laughs> of a raccoon, but anyway. Um, I saw it, an interview that you did with a bookstore and you talked about, because now that we've seen where you lived when you built, you and your husband built a cabin, mm -hmm. now that we've seen it and can appreciate and you had this very small child and you talked about having to wash diapers. Yeah. 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 Under, under very, you know, difficult circumstances and thought, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There were, there were a number of things it, when I was writing the Marsh King's Daughter, we did not live completely off the grid. You know, we bought our meat at the grocery store. In fact, I'd never hunted or fished. And I, so I had to research that part for the Marsh King's Daughter. But um, yeah, I, I've washed cloth diapers by hand in a bucket and it's every bit as nasty <laughs> as it sounds, let me tell you. <laughs> so, yeah. Karen, I'm just curious, this is sort of off subject, but what does your husband do or what did he, I just kind of impressed that you all built a cabin from the ground up out yeah. in the wilderness. Well, at the time when we were first married, my husband was a stoneware potter. And so we made our living traveling around to art shows selling his pottery. And when we got the idea to um, buy a piece of land, we first went down south, you know, looking at um, Kentucky and Georgia and wherever. And we met a potter in Kentucky who said that, uh, well, first off, all the, the land down there was too expensive for us. <laughs> so he met a potter in Kentucky who said that he sold a lot of his uh, wares in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. So we came back to the Detroit area, regrouped, went north, and basically just kept going until we found land that we could afford. And so it was purely by chance that, that we ended up there. We thought we were going to live off the land, which is like anybody who knows anything about the Upper Peninsula, I'm sorry, tomatoes don't even get ripe. You are not gonna live off the land. <laughs> <laughs> wrong idea so um yeah but i i uh so for for all the years that we lived in the up we were self-employed and you know we did a variety of jobs he cut meat he cut trees um we did furniture upholstery and uh just kind of just kind of got by and i do think it's interesting because um after 30 years in the upper peninsula we moved to the detroit area to mainly to help our aging parents um and and um, during all the time that we lived in the Upper Peninsula, financially, we didn't have much. You know, we, we gave the kids a good life because, you know, you live in the country, you can do that. But, you know, we did not have financial security. So when I uh, got the idea for The Marsh King's Daughter, I knew that this book had the potential to, to do well commercially. You know, it would be, have broad appeal. So instead of helping my husband in the upholstery shop uh, for a year, I wrote and he carried the ball himself. And we were thinking, okay, maybe then, you know, on the proceeds from the book, he can retire. And, you know, we set our sights like at this level. If, if the book sells for this much and by sell, what it is is the major publishers give you an advance against your share of the royalty. So you do get some money up front. We thought, well, we could just make retirement work because we had no savings, no pension plan. What was he going to do? Be 80 years old and still, you know, carry people's couches into their into their homes. Um, and it it just the reception was astonishing. And so it it sold at auction. 
uh, what that means is more than one publisher wanted to buy the book. Um, actually, 12 publishers wanted to buy the book. So, you know, there was a bidding war and the price kept going up and up. It was pretty astonishing what the price they ended up paying for it. So the day the book sold, my husband officially retired. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> so. But you've been involved in helping other writers. Is that correct? That you've done a lot of work with with helping other people get published or get recognition? Yeah, I have. And so I started writing seriously when I lived in St. Davis in the Upper Peninsula roughly 20 odd years ago. <clears throat> and I didn't know any writers in person. So I started connecting with writers online. And, you know, one thing led to another. I ended up co-founding a writer's organization called Backspace. And um, you know, the goal being that writers would help each other get published. I do think it's interesting because some of the early members of, of that group have become New York Times bestselling authors. One early member was Sarah Bruin. She wrote Water for Elephants, if you all remember. Oh, yeah. 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 So um, it was a group of, of writers who you know, had the potential, but didn't really know a lot about the business. And I guess basically it's just like, I was helped so much by people because you know, you're not born knowing these things that I wanted to in turn help others. And so we ended up having writers conferences in New York. Um, there were times when I thought, well, maybe I should never mind writing because, you know, I wasn't seeing a lot of success with it, financial success, and which I needed to have because otherwise I couldn't justify the time, you know, put into it. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, the conferences were successful and maybe I would just do that instead. But um, I happened to notice in the lead up to my 2013 conference that a writer who had gotten her literary agent at one of my previous conferences was coming out with her subsequent novel. And I hadn't written anything. And I thought, ah, no, I'm not done, you know? So I dialed back the extracurricular activities like, like organizing conferences. And it wasn't too long after that that I got the idea for The Marsh King's Daughters. And I think it's so interesting because it's like, you know, had I quit writing, I never would have known what was right around the corner for me. So it, it's kind of an interesting um, ex experience or uh, object lesson on uh, not, not giving up. That's really inspiring to me. I mean, a lot of you guys know that I like to dabble in writing and right. but I, I'll do like a short story or like a couple chapters and then it just kind of ends there for me. And then, but so, and then I also think I'm like, well, I'm, I'm 40, like, this and that am I and you know so like to hear your story it's like well maybe I need to to suck it up and you know I mean this past year my kids were at home and I was schooling them but um you know I mean both my kids are going to be in school in the fall and I'm gonna have extra time so yeah well I I encourage you to give it a try the thing is um about writing is it age doesn't matter. In fact, I think an older writer brings more to the page because, you know, you bring the culmination of your life experience. Um, the Marsh King's Daughter, my breakout book, was was uh, reviewed in the New York Times. And it was a rave review, which, you know, you can imagine, Amy, for an author that's like, kill me now. <laughs> it's not going to get any better than this. And the reviewer said um, that the book was um, uh, subtle, brilliant and mature. <laughs> and I, I liked that he said subtle because, you know, I do the book like The Wicked Sister too is, is I think of it as underwritten in places. And then brilliant, of course, I'll take that, you know, but he said mature. And so there is, there's like a maturity that comes through in the pages, you know, when, when as I said, you bring your life experience to the, to the page. I won creative writing awards when I was in high school, did a whole bunch of other things when my son was in high school, um, he's a talented writer and I was encouraging him to enter the same contest. And I thought, you know, what about me? I, I used to be a good writer. So I spent about a year writing short stories. So that's interesting that you're writing short stories, Amy. And um, I think it's good training. It was to get the creative juices flowing again, but also in a short story, every word matters, you know, because they're short, <laughs> you know, they still need to have a beginning and a middle and an end and a, and you know, character development and all those pieces that, you know, happen in a novel. But um, uh, yeah, and so then about a, after about a year of that, I decided I was going to write a novel. Um, that novel got me my literary agent, although it's never been published. <laughs> and uh, I don't plan to re revisit it. So, uh, you know, and it just goes on from there. So um, yeah, best wishes with your endeavors. 
And, you know, you can set little goals too, like, you know, I'm going to get 500 words written each day or whatever it might be to uh, make forward progress. That's cool. Thanks. Yeah. I just wanted to say just a little bit off the subject and, and off Wicked Sister. I got to know Karen before I read The Marsh King's Daughter. And so I knew Karen and then I read this book. It was a real page turner. I got through but When I got to the end, it was getting a little dark for me. And I thought to myself, well, who is she? <laughs> and Did I go stay with her? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going up to the, the you know, these uh, creepy wood through the woods to get to her house. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't know. But it's what Karen, you know, what you said to me today, because it helped me to better understand is why the end of the book had to be like it was. And so do you want to explain that? Yeah. So so in the March King's Daughter, um, briefly, uh, it's the story of a young girl who for 12 years, she lives, grows up with her mother and father in an isolated cabin in the Tacoma River Valley, surrounded by swamp or marsh. And in all that time, she never sees anyone except her mother and father, which might sound grim, but she loves her life. It's, it's all she knows. She, she likes hunting and fishing and foraging. She's a little tomboy. She finds out when she's 12, the reason they live like that is because her father kidnapped her mother when her mother was a teenager and she's the product of that crime. So what Renee is referring to is, and I won't give specifics because in case anybody hasn't read it, but it definitely gets dark towards the end. Um, and the reason for that is I knew from the beginning that Helena would leave the marsh when she's 12, when she finds this out by her own choice, because there's nothing heroic about her and her mother just being rescued and fucked out of the marsh. You know, she. For her to make that decision after loving her father to such an extreme, you know, she needed to see her father for the bad person that he really was. So, you know, some kind of ugly things happened, but I, I felt like I'd written myself into a corner. If I was going to be true to the story that I was telling, then, you know, I had to go there. And I will say this, those scenes are not in the movie. Hooray! <laughs> Because if, if anybody read it, um, I don't want to see those scenes on the screen. Uh, they're, they've changed a lot in the movie. I have read the script. And um, there's a reason that, you know, it will say on the screen based on the book by such and such. It's not a recreation of the story. It's, it's taking the heart of the story. You know, Helena's complicated, complex relationship with her father. And, you know, bringing it to the screen in a cinematic way. So um, they actually don't have that. She is, she and her mother is, are just plucked out and rescued and her mother takes the initiative in them leaving. And I was like, ah, because to me, that was like a big important part of the story. But I, I understand why they had to do it. You know, they're just, they, they are the time constraints. They just have to have to get it out there. So uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> okay, so, so just I another question. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I did not read The Marsh King's Daughter, but I think you're one of the biggest, um, or maybe uh, a subtlety, but something that's really influential that I'm hearing from The Marsh King's Daughter and what I read in The Wicked Sister is the setting. So when people are isolated, I think without an outward perspective, they are more apt to do things that are not characteristic or possibly unethical or maybe go against um, like what we feel we should be doing. Like when I'm around my friends and I'm like, hey, let me tell you what happened. And like, you know, Gretchen will be like, what are you talking about? Like that's nuts or something, you know? But when, <laughs> when you're isolated and maybe you don't know if you should tell like somebody closest to you, I think that's when the crazy stuff happens, right? So when somebody says, oh, that never would have happened or that's outlandish or, you know, something like that. I'm like, no, when you don't have an outside perspective and you hear this a lot with like, recluses or people who don't have a lot of friends or, you know, the state of themselves or whatever, you know, when you're in your own head like that, it can get pretty crazy. So I, I really appreciated that element about this book. And it makes me want to read the Marsh King's daughter because that's when the crazy stuff happens. So I, I enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. That's very insightful. I, I think you're right on that, you know, and 
And I think that's one reason why I'm drawn to these isolated settings. It really strips the story down to its essential. You know, you've only got a few characters and, and how they interact. Um, I think I've told you enough about the Marsh King's Daughter. So I, I like to make the argument, I think I can do so legitimately, that Helena, as she was growing up, loved her father with a greater love than any child has ever had for their father because there were no other adults in her life. There was nobody else except her father and her mother and her, her father showed disdain for the mother. And so that's what Rachel learned too. So it was, her father was her whole world. And then when, you know, these bad things happen and she leaves the marsh, things don't go well for her when she leaves the marsh, as you might imagine. Um, she knows nothing about, you know, technology or pop culture or social norms. She feels like a fool every time she turns around and, and she's like, it's her teenage years, so she hates her father, right, <laughs> for not teaching her about these things. And then when she's 18, she's had enough of all of the notoriety, and so she she reinvents herself. She takes on a new name and a new identity. So she, in effect, denies her father, right? And then by the end of the book, you know, it's no secret to say that he escapes from from prison in the present day, and she has to hunt him down because that shows up in the first page or so and of of the book. So then she has to basically come to terms with who she is and what her heritage is. So by having so few characters, back to what you're saying about the isolation, if that same story had tried to play out in an urban setting, it, would, it wouldn't have come out the same, right? You know, or if she had access to television or, or something like that. So uh, yeah, it does give the opportunity to, to explore relationships in, a, in almost a pure form. Yeah. I thought it was interesting, you know, authors now you get like anyone else who has any kind of, of fame is that you get so much social media and it's going to cover a real landscape there. <laughs> so, but with, with uh, the Wicked Sister, there was a warning for the people who get triggered by animals and taxidermy and it was and so I was a little, when I, I saw that before I got the book and I, I, I think I was on Goodreads and it came up and you know, there are people who have trigger warnings. I, I was anticipating something much darker as far as the animals, because there were people who were, because you're always going to have a segment who freaks out, who are right. freaking out about trigger warnings. This book involves mutilation of animals and abuse of animals. And it was like, you know, so we, so, so you have things to deal with that maybe yeah. authors in the past did not have. I agree. And and I, I don't see it as that. And the Marsh King's Daughter, people will put up, you know, trigger warnings for the abuse of animals. Um, they're hunting. <laughs> they're eating animals. <laughs> I'm sorry. Our, you know, as an author, I think to myself, you who, who is writing these things, are you a vegetarian or do you, you know, do you eat a hamburger? So, um, but everybody, you know, as an author, you do have to develop a, a thick skin, you know, some, and I figure even if I don't agree with somebody's reaction, it's their honest reaction, right? And so they're entitled to think that about the book. That's- If they've read the book. Yeah. That's, that's my only caveat there is you are entitled to your opinion. If you've seen the movie, if you've listened to the music, if you've read the book, if you haven't done those things, just don't comment. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I often and somebody will do a review and I, they'll tag me on, you know, Instagram or something like that. And I always read the review before I like it because occasionally people will give a book a bad review and they'll tag the author because they want, the author, I guess, to be sure the author. <laughs> yeah. Again, you know, yeah. fine, that's your opinion, but uh, I'm not going to comment on on the review yeah that's that's some you know that's a personal issue there <laughs> right right yeah 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 social media has definitely you know created an interesting world for authors we could that we could talk about that a long time i'm, I'm watching the clock and i see you know it's kind of running out here just maybe a couple more questions and then uh i'll have to pop out Comments. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And, <laughs> yeah. What's that? I would say thank you so much for joining us and um, giving us all the insights. It's great.
Oh, thank you. This is this is such a treat for me, I have to say, because, um, you know, writing is a solitary thing. You know, I sit behind my computer and I write and, you know, I put these words on the page hoping that somebody will read it. And so to be able to, you know, go out and do an event and, and talk to authors in person, this is the next best thing. We wouldn't be getting together. You guys are from all over the country, right? So how could we meet uh, yeah. and talk and, you know, get to know each other and talk about the book and other books and whatever. So thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I can tell you, you have our full support. Anything you write, oh, you. I'll be taking, and it will be on our list. No questions asked. This book was incredible. It was dripping from the start to the finish. Oh, like every bit of it to let you down. So it was really wonderfully written. I really appreciate hearing that. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty easy to find on the web. So uh, if you, anybody reads The Marsh King's Daughter, feel free to shoot me an email and let me know what you thought of that, too. I would enjoy that. I'm excited to dive into that one, for sure. Yeah, yeah I'm going to definitely read that if mm -hmm. I find time in Brittany's schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just so many good books. Yeah. I can't help it. Oh my goodness. And as you guys continue to write, you know, we read something and I fell in love with you through this. And I'm like, I'm going to go back and read Marsh King's Daughter. But anything going forward will make our list. I can guarantee you, you like I said, I'm going to support. So I can't wait for your next book. I'm so excited. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Brittany, and for inviting me. And thank you all for having me. And, you know, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Karen. Renee Bye. joined us also. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Bye. Renee, it was wonderful to see you. Bye. Bye, Renee. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wow, that was really cool. Uh -huh. That was amazing.